outrageous catches, loads of lost balls, and the most 150 plus scores in a week of the county championship ever. Welcome to County Cricket Weekly. Welcome back to County Cricket Weekly on the Cricket District Network. I'm Toby Marriott, joined by Atif Nawaz. It's been another cracking week of cricket in the county championship. We've seen outrageous catches. We've seen balls lost in the stands and we've seen teams piling on the runs. Atif, firstly, how are you? I'm very well. I think Good. cracking is the perfect word, by the way, because that's the sound the ball's been making off the bat this whole week. Great time to be a batter. Great time to be a batter. I'd love to know a few of your favourite moments from round two of the County Championship. Obviously, we've seen a lot of runs scored, but have there any, been any performances that have stood out to you? Oh, there were loads of performances. I mean, again, we're going to focus on the batters because that's where a lot of the glory happened. Uh, you know, so many great hundreds. Keaton Jennings, like I've been keeping an eye on him for a while because he's been doing really well. I know it's some people are looking at some of these hundreds as a false positive because of the Kookaburra ball and the pitches and April and blah, 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 blah. But Keaton Jennings, he's averaging 60 since 2021 in the county championship. Uh, this was an outstanding century from him as well. Just chanceless knock. He just looked every bit that player, you know, what, five years removed from playing for England now. And I feel like, you know, he's got to be putting himself back in the mix a bit. So Keaton Jennings, I enjoyed watching. Nathan Fernandez, another centurion. Uh, on debut for Middlesex, on first class debut, 19 years old, gets himself a ton, like very happy for him. Um, you know, I, I've got a sort of a loose connection with him. My nephews uh, played club cricket with him. So again, just like really, really pleased for him. And Emilio Gay, like, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that more, but another one, 24 years old and getting a double hundred. Like, yeah, what a time. But April is going to be the batter's favourite month in the county championship. How strange is that to yeah. think that April, the time traditionally associated with a swinging Duke's ball, I'm sure there are a lot of bowlers who have recently retired who'd be quite happy to know yeah. they're not bowling I've with the cricket ball. <laughs> Let's quickly touch on that before we get stuck into the highlights. Okay. What do you make of that situation? A change of ball. Obviously, it's a challenge for the bowlers now, and it's traditionally been a period where they can swing it. And yeah potentially not bowl at high speeds, but still get wickets. What do you think of that whole situation? I sort of understand, like, I know there's like sort of warring perspectives on it. So, you know, Alex Stewart, for example, dislikes this intensely. Rob Key really likes it. He wants to do this across the board, right, for the whole season. Um, I understand sort of eliminating that, uh, that sort of that medium, the military medium county bowler that can just snip it away a little bit because it's a hand stitch juke, hand stitch. Hand stitched Duke's ball, easy for me to say. <laughs> so yeah, get rid of it. So I don't have to say that. No, but like the cooker obviously is like very standardized. So like you know, um, I remember Stephen Finn told me you just don't get anything out of it. So especially if you've got a soft pitch in April, it's never gonna come up. So short ball ploys are out of it and everything. So as a batter, you're quite you know it. You know what you're working with a lot more. That unpredictability from the bowler disappears a little bit. Um, I sort of understand sort of toughening up a little bit for the bowlers, but. To what end? Like, if Scott Boland is not getting anything out of this surface, I mean, he was being driven for fun uh, by the Warwickshire batters. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, you know, I don't know if it's... Like, I'm. there's people better placed than me, I'm sure, to make the decision. But I think I'm not a fatalist about it. But you do worry because, you know, a, a lot of these batters are getting huge runs and not taking anything away from all the batters getting double hundreds and hundreds and triple hundreds and in some cases. But I, I just think... You know, you have to consider the handicap that you're putting some of the bowlers at. Just thinking about it. I don't know. Jury's out. But Rob Key loves it and he's smart. So, And he's in charge. <laughs> and he's in charge. In yeah. charge. We love you, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he's. It, I mean, let's see what happens next. But uh, I think there's a lot of bowlers that will be very grateful for going back to the other ball next week. I'm sure. And I'm sure Darren Stevens is quite happy he's retired. <laughs> um, cool. Enough chat for now. Let's take a look at the scorecards from round two of the Vitality County Championship, starting with Division One. After a complete washout in round one, Hampshire got their 2024 campaign underway by welcoming Lancashire to the Utalita Bowl. Batting first, Hampshire found themselves in an early spot of bother, losing openers Fletcher Middleton and Ali Orr within the first 15 overs of play. The host middle order set about repairing the damage with half centuries from James Vince, Nick Gubbins, Tom Prest and Liam Dawson lifting Hampshire to 367 all out. Australian test star Nathan Lyon finished as the pick of the Lancashire bowlers grabbing three wickets for his new side. In reply, former England opener Keaton Jennings was the star of the show. While spending seven hours at the crease, the Lancashire captain displayed a full array of strokes on his way to a superb 172. Batting in partnership with George Bell, the pair lifted the Red Rose County to 484 and a significant first innings lead. 
Sadly for Bell, a direct hit run out cruelly ended his innings one run short of what would have been his maiden first class 100. Lancashire made a bright start to the third innings, removing Hampshire's openers cheaply again. Sadly, the weather intervened on the morning of day four, leaving limited time to force a result. Nick Gubbins finishing on 69 not out and the team settling for a draw. Durham made the trip down south to Edgbaston for their eagerly awaited return to action in Division 1 of the Vitality County Championship. Reminiscent of Nasser Hussain at the Gabba, Durham captain Scott Borthwick won the toss on an absolute road and elected to bowl first. This was about as good as it got for the visitors, with Warwickshire closing day one on a staggering 490 for one. The Durham bowling attack was put to the sword by big hundreds from Rob Yates, Will Rhodes and Alex Davies. The latter going on to make a career best 256 of 311 deliveries. This perfect delivery from Callum Parkinson to remove Ed Barnard was Durham's only moment to savour as the host declared on a whopping 698 for three. Warwickshire's second highest score ever. Durham were faced with a mountain to climb to save the game. That mountain got even taller with the away side losing two early wickets to find themselves 45 for two. Former England opener Alex Lees led the fight back, scoring 145 alongside 50s from Ollie Robinson and Graham Clark. All-rounder Ben Rain smashed five sixes on his way to 93 before his side were bowled out for 517. Still 181 runs short of Warwickshire score and crucially 31 runs shy of avoiding the follow-on. Sent straight back into bat, it was night watchman Matty Potts' turn to pile on the runs. The fast bowler advanced to his maiden first class 100, finishing on 149 not out before the team shook hands on a draw. Winter signings Dean Elgar and Jordan Cox continued their fine start to life at Essex with more runs as they faced Kent at the Cloud County ground. After the home side won the toss and elected to bat, the pair took their side from 10 for 2 to 169 for 3. Cox fell first for 67 to the bowling of George Garrett. Elgar joined at the crease by Matt Critchley, recorded his first 100 in Essex colours, going on to make 120. Critchley picked up the baton, racking up a career-high 153 not out and allowing his side to declare on 530 for 7. The Kent response was dominated by a pair of hundreds and a 224-run second wicket stand from Ben Compton and Daniel Bell Drummond. Critchley's fine game carried on, this time with the ball. The former Derbyshire man snaffled five wickets to blow away the lower order and Kent's chances of a first innings lead. Compton was the final wicket to fall, his marathon knock lasting 512 minutes for 165 runs, Kent finishing on 417 all out. With the threat of bad weather looming, Essex put the foot down. Cox picked up where he left off, dispatching his former teammates to all parts of the ground. 89 balls and six sixes later, the 23-year-old was raising his bat for his maiden Essex 100. The rain arrived as expected on day four, making only 58 overs possible. Kent eventually clung on to the draw with young Jaden Denley, nephew of Joe, making 41, leaving Essex three wickets away from back to back wins. It was a familiar story at Trent Bridge as rain denied Worcestershire the chance to push for victory on day four. The home side won the toss and elected to bat first, a decision which immediately looked to have backfired just three overs in when Hasib Hamid had his stumps blown to all parts by Nathan Smith. Joe Clark then took the attack to the Worcestershire bowlers, striking his second century of the county championship season, which included three massive sixes. Lyndon James fell agonizingly close to a century with 96, batting alongside the impressive Calvin Harrison, whose patient 50 lifted his side to 399 all out. Luke Fletcher made an early impact, removing Gareth Roderick with just the third ball of the second innings. One over later and Knott's had their second. Calvin Harrison taking a Ben Stokes-esque catch at third slip to remove Jake Libby. An early contender for catch of the season for sure. Harrison's game got even better, claiming 5 for 128 to help his side bowl Worcestershire out for 355. 90 from Rob Jones and 50s for Dolly Vera and Smith kept Worcestershire in the hunt. Not started the second inning strongly reaching 125 for two, but wickets quickly tumbled, leaving the home side reeling at 151 for seven and Worcestershire hopeful of a dramatic final day victory. Sadly, the poor weather meant no play was possible and the umpires had no choice but to abandon the match. Earlier that morning, a reported tornado ripped tiles off houses and brought down trees in Nottinghamshire, so we don't blame them for calling off the action early. Reigning champion Surrey took on Somerset for the first home game of the season and it proved an entertaining fixture at the Kia Oval. 
The game began with a brilliant reflex catch from Dom Sibley after a ricochet off teammate Jamie Overton before Tom Lamanby took control for the visitors, scoring a classy century and guiding his side to 197 for two alongside Matt Renshaw, who scored 87. But how quickly things can change. Renshaw's run out sparked a Somerset collapse to an eventual 285 all out. Cameron Steele, the pick of the bowlers, with four for 50. Surrey then got to work with the bat, Rory Burns and Dom Sibley reaching 167 without loss for the home side and Sibley registering his 20th first class 100 which included an array of fantastic drives through the covers. Youngster Casey Aldridge pegged the champions back by taking 5 for 64 but it wasn't enough to stop Surrey from piling on a first innings lead of 143. Dan Lawrence continues to impress with the ball this season. The unorthodox off-spinner claimed the first two wickets of the Somerset innings, including possibly the best celebrity peel we've ever seen to remove Renshaw. Lamanby's fine form continued into the second innings. The left-hander is yet to record a score of less than 50 this season. Further half-centuries from Lewis Goldsworthy, Lewis Gregory and Craig Overton helped to thwart the home side's charge towards victory. After finally breaking Somerset's stubborn resistance, the hosts were set a challenging target of 209 in 19 overs to win the game. Some fine ball striking from Jamie Smith and Lawrence gave Surrey a sniff of pulling off the unthinkable. However, time was called on the game with the home side 86 runs short of the target. So, five games in Division 1, five draws, but we weren't short of entertaining cricket, were we? No, I mean, there were a lot of runs scored, uh, a lot of bowlers having to work hard and think outside the box. We saw the slow bowlers, as expected, have a better better run of it. But again, you know, just because conditions are in your favour, you still got to score the runs. And, you know, just, just brilliant performances, like at Lancashire, for example. I thought that was, you know, that, that performance from Lancashire, I'd just say. Like, it was very impressive because they were under pressure. So bowling teams do manage to put batting teams under pressure despite what the scoreboard looks like you have to show different facets to your game to make it work yeah i also think in terms of the draws like there's a reason they call it the county grind right it's <laughs> difficult to get a result even when the weather plays ball so throwing a bit of rain and a kookaburra ball that doesn't swing quite as much it's no surprise that we saw so many draws but we saw some fantastic performances. You mentioned Keaton Jennings yep. there. We've also seen, you know, Essex versus Kent. Jordan Cox scoring 100 against his former side, absolutely smashing it to yeah. all parts of Chelmsford. Um, let's start Jennings, Hampshire v Lancashire. Yeah. What impressed you so much about that knock? Well, it wasn't easy, you mm. know. Like, I'm not to say that any of the hundreds of score. I have to be very careful. I don't want to offend anyone, but you know, certain conditions really lent themselves to batter scoring runs. That was that. There's no denying that, right? If you're a batter and you're applying yourself in various conditions that the, that we were met with in the second week, like you could find yourself scoring runs quite in a relatively straightforward way. Keaton Jennings didn't have that, right? He came in under pressure, you know, batters around him feeling the pressure, and he had to really grind. You know, he had to work really hard. He found he showed a lot of fluency later, and he played some gorgeous shots. But it was about that that sort of resistance that really impressed me. Like this is a, a quality that's going to you know translate to Test cricket. This is the idea, right? This is what we're trying to do is like create this cauldron where you're going to create players for test cricket, with their man mentality for test cricket. And that's what I think he demonstrated. So this is it. It's And it's not an overnight thing. He's racking up the runs, but he's also demonstrating that transition of temperament as well. It's been five years and he's. I, I feel like he's knocking on the door. He yeah. should be at least. I mean, speaking of knocking on the door, Daniel Bell Drummond, yeah. um, you know, more runs for Kent. He's not really talked about in that kind of conversation, um, but he's club captain now. He's performing, you know, at the highest level for Kent across multiple formats. How impressed with you uh, are you with him um, and the likes of Jordan Cox playing against his former team, scoring lots of runs as well? Um, I get the sense that there are a lot of players out there knocking on the door for England, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the idea, right? And particularly with these younger players, you know that they've got, they've got that opportunity. They're really hungry for it. So they take all of these, like nobody's taking this lightly and thinking, oh, you know what? I'll just play a bit of champo. And then when the blast comes and the hundred comes, I'll start, you know, because a lot, they're all multi-format players. The people you've mentioned, right? Mm. Bell Drummond and Jordan Cox. And, you know, they could easily think of it that way, but they don't. Every opportunity out in the middle is an opportunity to impress and remind them, like remind the team they're on their heels, right? Mm. They're right there. To, to, to get on that plane to wherever it is the team's going. Some big test series obviously coming up for England. There's always big test series with England, but uh, right now there's a focus on what county cricket can produce mm. and you know the, the, the support that the national team gets from county cricket. So with that in mind, the narrative is perfect for players like Jennings, Bell Drummond, 
uh, Cox and so many others actually. There's others we'll talk about for sure. Mm. Like this is this is the shop window, and yeah. you know they're really shining it. And talk about window as well from for Red Bull cricket perspective. There's no other Red Bull cricket going on right now around the world. You've got no. county cricket. I know people talk about oh it shouldn't be played in April. It's too wet. But actually, if you love Red Bull cricket, this is what you need to be watching in April. Yeah, and you know it's it's a different kind of test, right? As opposed, you're always going to go to conditions around the world that aren't you know July on a hot summer's day at Lords, right? It, it, you're going to go to places where it's difficult, uh, difficult conditions, not far from ideal conditions, where it is a little bit moist, where it is a little bit slow and low and, you know, soft pitches. You'll find that at places. So, you know, the simulation of test cricket, which is what I think county cricket should be, as close as possible, a simulation of that environment, right? Like, it's going to be versatile. So if you're going to play in April, you're also going to play in June and July and August, and, you know, you're going to get all of it. So... If there's no one, like Red Bull enthusiasts, they've literally got nothing. There's a whole, like, dearth of T20 cricket happening, right? Obviously, there's IPL, but there's also, like, um, sort of, you know, the lower-ranked teams in, in the world and, and all sorts of stuff. Like, this is this is it. The window is good, and it's really good quality now. Mm. So if you want to watch it, you can watch it in fantastic quality. It's really accessible, and they know that the players know this. Mm. They know that people are watching them. They read all the... Co- like, I, I know some players are like very anti-social media. But most of the time, players are tracking everything that's being said about them. And they they want that to build. They want to build that swell of support that will ultimately get them in the in the Lions colours. Yeah, spot on. And even England test level. I mean, Brendan McCullum even admitted that he hadn't really heard of Shah Bashir before he saw him on the yeah. County Championship Twitter feed. Yeah, that was absurd. <laughs> like, you know, like just Sir Alistair Cook saying, this guy's quite good. To Ben Stokes, who says, "Oh, he is quite good," and then McCullum saying, "He's quite tall." Yeah, that would work. Like I'm <laughs> paraphrasing all of them, but it's 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 remarkable. Like you know, people are very quick to dismiss the county championship as like you know a thing that's you know a different level or something separate from Test cricket somehow, right? But uh, you know, this is why like I sort of like the idea of backing Rob Key with this Cookaburra experiment because like, you know, I know it's very divisive and people talk about it a lot and a lot's been said and I'm sure a lot of people are over the discussion as well. But I do like the idea of, you know, creating different environments, trying to create that link between test and uh, county championship. So you're going to play in Ashes in Australia with a Cookaburra ball. You need to get used to a Cookaburra ball, right? Okay, it's never going to be a a like for like comparison there's always going to be some kind of issue it's never going to be ideal but it's worth having that experiment i think and hey you just put a ton of overs on scott boland so (laughs) so it's not the worst thing in the world from an england perspective and give a few spinners like mason crane who ended up bowling 25 overs the opportunity to actually bowl that kind of spell in april when they wouldn't necessarily get the opportunity to do i think he picked up four wickets bowl really well bowl with control He'd very rarely get the chance to do that at this time of year. So And, and all round credentials. Spot so on. You look at people like Moen Ali, for example, right? Mm. Like he wasn't like he was a every now and again spinner, right? But then when he played for England, in especially in those middle that middle phase, he was the front line spinner, right? And eventually he became, I think, you know, a really, really good spinner. So like opportunities like this, the opportunity is very much for those sometimes spin bowlers, mm. because they get a chance to come in, build some confidence, take some wickets. And all of a sudden, oh, he's quite, he's handy. And then, you know, before you know it, you're bowling, bowling more and more and more. And you become a, an, a, a genuine all-rounder. So there, there are opportunities all over the place for the taking. I love it. Cricket History HQ, we're always seeing the positive in any kind of situation. Well, just trying to find, it's raining outside, <laughs> so why not? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, before we move on to recapping Division 2, mm-hmm. um, love to talk about a couple of more performances that really stood out. Obviously, Critchley scoring 150 and taking five wickets. Nottinghamshire v Worcestershire, you've got Joe Clark scoring a brilliant 100 there. Any other performances that stand out for you? Obviously, Dean Elgar coming over from South Africa, playing uh, for Essex, scoring his first 100. Um, and Warwickshire v Durham. I mean, Alex Davies smashing it to all parts at Edgebaston. I know you spend a bit of time up at Edgebaston. You must yeah. be pretty proud of them scoring nearly 700 runs for the loss of three wickets. Well, there were so many, right? So Alex Davies got 256. Robbie Yates got 191. Will Rhodes got 178 not out. And they're all, like, let me tell you, all three of them are just lovely, lovely people. So, you know, I, I'm always here for the, the nice guy, right? <laughs> yeah. Always here for the nice guy and the nice girl. Like, I always want to see them do well. Um, it was just, it was extraordinary. Just really, really good batting, really sensible batting. We've mentioned, like, you know, Scott Boland's there and he's got some hype about him. But they could, sort of worked out what was going on early doors and then just piled on the runs. And they looked un- unstoppable. Mm. When I was watching part of that stream, it made it reminded me of like the first day of uh, Pakistan versus England 
on the test uh, tour to Raul Pindi a couple of years ago, where England scored 500 plus in one day. Like, it wasn't as fast as that, but it wasn't a million miles off. They were just dominating. Like, you've not seen dominance like that. And, you know, Alex Davis is a very fine player, you know, very highly rated at Warwickshire, but he'd never done anything like that before. Mm. So this is going to be a huge shot in the arm for him. So I'm very excited for him. So here's my question for you, Toby. Will Ben Stokes play next week based on the footage that we've seen of him? He'll play. He'll want to play as a batter. <laughs> <laughs> Having looked at the scores um, from week two, I doubt he'll be that excited to bowl. Um, that being said, brilliant to see him back. Great to see some footage of him um, fighting fit. I'm sure there were lots of questions about whether he was ever going to bowl again yeah. um, and whether if he was going to bowl, whether he was going to bowl at any kind of pace. But he looks like he's, yeah, fit it was a and bit, firing. He said it was a bit wet for him up north and stuff. <laughs> if he comes all the way down south to where we are right now, yeah. I don't think he'd enjoy bowling here. Not even on the it. south coast. Not right now. No. Not even with a tape ball. But no. great to see players like him back in their county kit, back warming up. Um, that's the brilliant thing about the Kansas Championship. You've got players from all around the world yeah. who have played at test level, international level, representing counties yeah. in the oldest format. It's brilliant. England has box, so, so many box office players. Like, you know, they are genuine stars. So when they go back, like a Ben Stokes is like huge, right? When he goes back, plays county cricket, it is an event. The world is taking note. Everybody's watching. People are interested, even if they're not watching the stream live. I'm sure the stream gets a nice, nice, nice boost when he's out there batting or bowling. But like, the world is all of a sudden interested. People are looking it up in notes and how many did he score? What were his bowling figures? Like that kind of interest just has a beautiful knock-on uh, effect for the competition because it's more interest. And mm. Ben Stokes is one of the most interesting players in world cricket. So keep playing at Durham, Ben. We'd love to see it. I love the idea of fans seeing Ben Stokes warm up at Durham. They go and check the score and they see, wow, who's this up and coming batter? Matty Potts <laughs> scoring 149. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out he's a night watchman and he somehow managed to nearly score 150. Um, I doubt I'll ever get the chance to score that again. Only in April in the county championship <laughs> with a cooker. Bro no, you know what? You know what? Who you knows? You never know. Who you knows? never know. Who knows? He'll be batting five for England next week. <laughs> Who knows? Let's quickly touch on Somerset v Surrey. A fantastic game. Dan Lawrence yes. moved from Essex to Surrey. Um, and he's taking loads of wickets with the ball. He's getting plenty of opportunity to bowl. What do you think of that? I, well, that's what I'm talking about, right? Like, you might not have got that opportunity <laughs> yeah, exactly. if, the, if it was a Duke's ball and it was swinging around all over the place. Um, no, he's, he's done really well. He settled into life there quite well, it looks like. You know, he talked about how excited he was about living in London and with his partner and stuff. Like, I think he was very excited about that. So um, he's happy, you know, and that's coming through in his cricket. Um, Surrey is still sort of in the mix. Like, I know that Essex have taken an early lead by virtue of being the only team to have won a game so far this season. Uh, but they're, they're never away from the top half of Surrey. And, you know, having a player like Dan Lawrence, it really just, um, you know, and he's, you know, he is one of those players who's, if he's not scoring runs, he's going to get wickets. Don't get wickets. He's gonna be taking catches. He's gonna be like chatting away out in the middle. Like he is an X Factor player. And I think he's one of the ones that's gonna benefit from this opportunity to get more bowling overs. I'm very grateful. He's in my fantasy team. So well done, Dan. <laughs> well done, Dan. <laughs> so despite there only being five draws out of yeah. five games, still been a really entertaining week of cricket in Division One. Yeah. Let's take a look at Division 2, shall we, of the Vitality County Championship. It was a case of deja vu for Middlesex following their run fest last week at Lords. Spearheaded by the stylish opener Emilio Gay, the hosts finished day one on 311 for three. Gay continued his form the following morning, plundering his highest first class score of 261. James Sales supported throughout, scoring his maiden first class 100 before the host declared on 552 for six. In reply, 19-year-old opener Nathan Fernandez became Middlesex's youngest debut centurion in first-class cricket since 1862. The visitors proceeded to pile on the runs, lose Deploy and Max Holden taking a hold of the North Hans bowling attack. Deploy racked up a near-runner ball, 196 not out, and Holden passed 200 for the first time in his career. Sadly, more rain followed on day four, with Middlesex finishing on 553 for two and the game ending in a stalemate. A Yorkshire side including Joe Root and Harry Brook were left frustrated by a determined Gloucestershire side in Bristol. Gloucestershire bowled superbly on the morning of day one. Josh Shaw bowled Finlay Bean with an absolute beauty through the gate in the first over, and Zaman Akhtar took his first professional five wicket haul, including the wickets of Joe Root and Harry Brook. Yorkshire captain Sean Masood then came to the rescue for his side. 
The Pakistani batter scored a fantastic 140, including 24s, helping Yorkshire recover from 90 for 5 to 326 all out. This was his third century in nine championship matches wearing the white rose. Cameron Bancroft steadied the ship for Gloucestershire in reply, batting hard to bring up his 50 from 160 balls. Yorkshire took regular wickets to dent the home side hopes of a first innings lead. Ben Charlesworth batting aggressively for his 52 before being left stranded as Gloucestershire were bowled out for 263. The Yorkshire batters who missed out in the first inning certainly weren't going to let that happen again. Adam Lythe hit his 34th first-class century before Root, Brook and Hill all registered brisk 50s to take Yorkshire to a commanding 434 for four declared. Gloucestershire would need to hit their highest ever run chase to win and they gave it a good go. Despite finishing day three on a perilous position of 97 for four, the hosts managed to close the game on 405 for six thanks to a career best 147 from Ollie Price and a century from James Bracey. The pair shared a fifth wicket stand of 199, Bracey making 102 before Graham Von Buren and Ben Charlesworth batted confidently to secure the draw. Alex Thompson starred with the ball for Derbyshire as they took on Glamorgan in Cardiff. The visitors won the toss and elected to bowl first, a decision that paid immediate dividends with Blair Tickner bowling round one triple centurion Sam Northeast with a perfect delivery. Alex Thompson's fantastic spell of offspin dismantled Glamorgan, Captain David Loy taking this absolute screamer at short leg to send his team into a frenzy. Kieran Carlson fought hard for his 74, Glamorgan ultimately bowled out for 237. Unfortunately for Derbyshire, they failed to capitalise on their first innings bowling display. James Harris made early inroads for the hosts and Mason Crane piled on the pressure with his leg spin, bowling a Herculean spell of 25 overs and picking up four wickets. The visitors would have fancied their chances when they reduced Glamorgan to 69 for four, but Chris Cook wrestled back the momentum, registering a wonderful 126 not out to take his side to 361 for seven declared. Fun fact, Chris Cook's 100 was the 1,000th first class 100 in Glamorgan's history. The team ended up splitting the points and settling for a draw on day four as Derbyshire's Lewis Rees and Brooke Guest guided their side from 79 for three to 225 for three at the close of play. The Upton Steel County ground played host to round two clash between promotion chasing rivals Leicestershire and Sussex. After being put into bat, Rishi Patel put away some wayward Sussex bowling, stroking 14 boundaries in a bright and breezy 87. The introduction of Finn Hudson Prentice changed the fortune of the visiting side. The all-rounder clean bowled Lewis Kim and Lewis Hill in consecutive balls, finishing with impressive figures of 5 for 50. 82 from the new Leicestershire recruit Liam Travaskis guided the host to 338 all out. Sussex's reply got off to the worst possible start, losing opener Tom Clark to the first ball of the innings. Fellow left-hander Tom Haynes was in a much less forgiving mood. Pouncing on any width given by the Leicestershire bowlers, Haynes raced his way to 108, setting up Sussex's innings at 184 for three. The runs continued to flow for the visitors. Captain John Simpson and Danny Lamb smashed the ball to all parts, each recording maiden Sussex centuries and combining for a seventh wicket partnership of 275. Simpson eventually declared the innings on 694 for eight, scoring the first double century of his career in the process. Hunting for a first win of the season, Jack Carson managed to pick up the wicket of Marcus Harris before stumps on day three. However, after several downpours on day four, any hopes of a result were sadly washed away. Right, there we have it. Uh, Division two, round two of the Vitality County Championship. More draws, but more entertaining cricket. Let's start with Northamptonshire versus Middlesex. <laughs> Why not? We said in our <laughs> recap, Middlesex must be feeling a bit of deja vu after Sam Northeast smashed the triple century. And this time round, they're up against Emilio Gay, who hits 260 odd. Yeah. Made it look easy. He did make it look easy. Obviously, they did something very similar a little bit later on. But yeah, I mean, he played beautifully. And again, another player to get really excited about. You know, we mentioned before, 24 years old, very elegant stroke play. I've seen him a few times live uh, playing. I think the last time I saw him was at Wantage Road. And, you know, he's just this beautifully elegant, you know, through the covers. He just always looks good. Mm. And he sort of gets out. Like, he's looking really good. He always looks good until he gets out, right? He's one of those kind of players. Um, but he, like, it was really nice to see him just sort of fulfill that. Just take it all the way. And, you know, go for the one and then the two and then the 250. Like, he really, you know, he really took it in stages and just looked so commanding at the crease. So, feels like a big coming out innings. Definitely. And he's only 23 or 24. He's still got plenty of years to come. Who knows? Maybe we'll see him playing for England one day. Another one <laughs> to get excited about. <laughs> yeah, but Middlesex fought back. 19-year-old um, opener Nathan Fernandez 
Middlesex's youngest debut centurion in first class cricket since 1862 and deploying Max Holden. Max Holden with another double hundred as well in this game, just piling on the runs. I love the county championship because you get random stats like that. Like, you know, <laughs> a record from 1862 has been broken in week two of the county championship. Like, it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, that whole game was mind-blowing, Toby. Think about it, right? Like, there's a lot that happened, but the person that I feel sorry for the most is Justin Broad, and I will tell you why. 1,105 runs were scored. That was the aggregate of the four days of play in this game, right? Both teams scoring runs. We mentioned all the players who got runs. Um, Emilio Gay, double 100. James Sales, 113, not out. Uh, Max Holden, double 100, unbeaten. Luce Deploy, nearly a double 100, 196 for him. Uh, Nathan Edwards, uh, Nathan Fernandez, sorry, uh, Century on debut. The first batter in this run fest, the first batter to stand up to the crease in this run fest <laughs> was Justin Broad who faced four balls and got out for one at the top of that match. Brutal. Now imagine being the guy who started that game, got was out early, so everybody's thinking, ooh, might be a low score, this could be a tricky pitch, and then they pile on another 1,104 runs over the course of the next four days. Like, I felt so bad for him, right? Like, because this is like an, abs this is insane. That's, that's got to feel awful to be the guy who got out for one in the game where almost everybody else got 100. That's, that's a tough one, man. Thoughts and prayers. I feel like every opening batter in the country, whether it's club cricket or test cricket, knows that feeling. When you get back to the oh, house yeah. and someone says, oh, is it doing a bit? It's like, oh, yeah, it's doing all sorts. And then everyone else goes out and scores hundreds. Oh, yeah. Out first ball, don't get to bowl. What a Saturday. Many a Saturday I've spent like that. So, um, yeah, I'm sure he'll have his have his day. But Higgins got... I mean, it looked like a different game at that point. Like, mm. imagine what early wicket down ball swinging lbw ryan higgins you already got some wickets so you're thinking oh you know this could be a different kind of game and then 1105 <laughs> runs it was a lot it was a lot let's talk about yorkshire gloucestershire yorkshire side packed with talent joe root harry brook but neither of those got the headlines in the first innings it was of course sharma suit yeah that's it brilliantly yeah and really rescued them from a tricky position to a commanding one yeah i think this is an important season for sharma suit like he's Last season, he was made captain of um, Yorkshire, and it was like a really big deal because it was part of the whole rebuilding. And, you know, that's a whole different story. But back home, Sean Masood's under a little bit of pressure for captaincy. Um, he had the unenviable task of captaining Pakistan to Australia, uh, a place they've just never won, right? So it was always going to be an uphill task, even though I thought Pakistan played well in that series. They lost all the matches. Now, he's being discussed, like, should he be the captain and now people are sort of looking at him quite granularly like you know like they're really just really putting the lens on him and, and his captaincy skills and uh, i think the one of the best qualities of a captain you come out and you play knocks like that especially when your team's under pressure yeah that's that's that was outstanding from sean it was much better than it than it looks on a scorecard because mm. you know like you said you know brookie didn't get much um you know joe root again like you know these are the names that people came to see these are the names that people were looking at the stream to watch but it wasn't them it was sean masood who got the runs just again demonstrating that immense value that he carries for yorkshire and their hopes to like get back up in division one cricket speaking of the scorecard just looking through it cameron bancroft took 160 balls to bring up his 50 showing that it's not all crash bang wallop no. in the county championship this season you do have to graph for it you have to grind to, to get Proper. some form Proper cricket. <laughs> proper proper cricket. Red Bull cricket. Though. Hashtag proper cricket. <laughs> um, let's quickly touch on Zaman Akhtar, another Saka graduate, um, picking up five wickets, I believe. Um, his first professional five-wicket haul. How impressed were you with his bowling? Obviously, he picked up the wickets of Joe Root and Harry Brook as well. And how good is it to see another graduate from the South Asian Cricket Academy coming through and performing at the highest level? They're having a great run. I mean, Kash shifted really well first week. Now you got Zaman doing well. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's great. It's really, really great. I was watching the sort of social media feed uh, on Instagram and like, you know, I'm noticing the swelling of numbers and things like, it's always really nice to be, to be able to see that happen. You know, particularly when you think it's, it's something that's very necessary, a needed thing and a really useful thing for English cricket. Um, it's brilliant. Really happy for him. Uh, really happy for Kashif as well. Like I can see them both like, you know, having long distinguished cricket careers, how far that goes. I don't know. Like, you know, early signs look good, but you never know. It's still April. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so, yeah, um, but it's really, it was really nice to see. And, you know, Saka, like all the coaches and all the people, all the staff that they have, 
you know, putting their programs together, that have had to fight for funding, that have had to like put, you know, work insanely hard to make this happen. Like it's sweet, sweet vindication. And it's a brilliant bowling display when the average score in this, you know, round of county championship fixtures is probably 500, yeah. 600. Yeah. You know, to bowl Yorkshire out for 326 is some going. It's, That's, it's a great yeah, go. Yeah. And, and then actually Gloucestershire actually made it pretty respectable. They gave it a great go. Um, James Bracey, Ollie Price, both getting hundreds. Um, and actually I think they were only 100, 150 runs short in the end. So yeah. actually a really good game there. And again, if there hadn't been a bit of rain about, who knows the way the game might have gone or the pace of the game. Um, there were a I think we could like have that. seen a few results this yeah. week. Yeah, as you say, I mean, there were a few that just, we nearly, like the weather played spoil sport. Like again, the headlines will be all about the ball and the pitches and blah, 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 blah in April. But it is, you know, it rains sometimes. So, you know, it's sad, but that kind of adds to the narrative of the county championship for me. Let's go to Glamorgan v Derbyshire. I think my favourite catch of the season so far is David Lloyd at leg slip. There is something about a catch at leg slip when a plan comes together for a team that just unleashes absolute scenes. I love it. What, what is the highest salary that any cricketer's ever been paid, like in the IPL? Like two million? Two million, million something yeah. like that? You could not pay me 10 times that amount <laughs> to stand at short leg in the county championship, right? Yeah. That ball comes flying at you. You never know yeah. how far. Like, I know these players back in the day would st st be at short leg. Not even a helmet, right? This is madness. I don't know how uh, people are so willing to stand there. Uh, and then to take that catch at short. Any short leg catch is always impressive. Anything. Because it's all about reflexes and stuff. But you know, the combination of bravery and reflexes and conditions and state of the match... I think you're right. I think that catch is going to take some topping. Absolute scenes. And there's something about county cricket. I feel like the celebrations go up a notch oh, because yeah. when you do have to really graft for a wicket and you put a plan in place and it all comes together, the celebrations are just that much more intense. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's ex it's exciting. Like I mean, I don't, you play club cricket, you know, all, so all you know, right? You know what it's like. Like, I mean, I've celebrated a wicket before when nobody, not even half my team was interested in the wicket. <laughs> but like, you know, and, and you know, this is huge. Like this means a huge deal to these players because like, you know, even players who might not ever go on to play for England or any other country, like this is a, a statistic that's going to that's going to be on their records. When people look up their cricketer profiles, it'll be there, you know, first class wicket, first yeah. class catch, first class runs. It's exciting. Mm. Right? It's really, really, I, I mean, if we're feeling secondhand excitement for them, imagine how excited they are. And there's something really special that we'll just touch on quickly about county cricket and the possibility of representing your place of birth, oh, your yeah. town, your county, which actually doesn't happen very often, particularly the way the game is going with the increase of franchise cricket opportunities and players switching between teams. I can't really keep up with who's playing in which IPL team, which Big Bash team. Oh, yeah. But with county cricket, you've got a lot of guys who don't play in those competitions, who spend all year round at the county where they grew up playing junior cricket. It means more. It does. Like, you know, that player... Like people are so invested in the journey of players like that who come through the academy or who went to school up the road and played for the local schools team and things like that. You know, it, there's something genuinely quite magical. I mean, going back uh, to uh, Nathan Fernandez, right? This is what makes him like that story because he went to school in Middlesex and he you know went through the system. I'm pretty sure he played for London schools team as well. And then like now he's playing for Middlesex and he's making his debut. And he's got, you know, I mean, it would have been a joyous occasion in his household. household. Like his father would have been so, you know, over the top thrilled and it would have felt like the culmination of something. Because you're right, it's very rare now. I mean, players go all over the place like Leicestershire and then Durham and then Essex and maybe Sussex, maybe Middlesex. Like people move around. That's just the nature of sport, right? And that and that's actually a sign of the sport growing more and more sophisticated, which is great. But uh, also the, the romantic in me loves that story of like, you know, the, the guy coming through, playing on his own, you know, that's really cool. It's just it's just really, really nice. Yeah, I think a great example of that is Finn Hudson Prentice yes. in Sussex. You know, homegrown talent. Um, all of the headlines will be about runs scored and double centurions in the county championship this week. But Finn bowled brilliantly for five wickets and with a kookaburra ball. He's been training hard over the winter. Um, doesn't really play that much white ball cricket. Doesn't really play any franchise cricket. But to take five wickets for Sussex and cement your place in the side is pretty special. It is, you know, um, again doing it at home, you know, for the club that you've, you've invested that time in. You, you're, rank, bang, you're bang on. Like, a lot of the players look for winter opportunities elsewhere. And, I mean, I don't know. You probably did as well. Like, everybody does, right? But sometimes you don't get them. So when you don't get them, you feel even more invested. It's like anything else. Like, you know, I work for one broadcaster because they're the only people that will, b will book me, right? <laughs> if, if other people book me, I might have, like, different... But I'm so invested in that. Uh, that when I do something cool for them, it feels really good. It would have felt it would have 
felt tenfold for him because he put in a whole winter of hard work to make that happen, as you say. Yeah. Before we go, let's quickly take a look at our player of the round. So third place, what do you reckon? Third place, I mean, it's a, it's a tough one. Like you're, you're sort of tempted to give it to all the batters, right? Um, th- I can't think of it in isolation. I have to think of it group-wise. So I want to give a higher rating to someone who's, who's given an all-round performance in what we've you know we've sort of universally acknowledged that more difficult bowling conditions. So Matt Critchley getting like a big hundred and five wicket haul, that's worth a lot. Proper. And then there was so many doubles to choose from. I feel like you'd go with the biggest one. So Emilio Gay probably. Yeah, that's with fair. A, apologies to everybody else that got double hundreds. <laughs> the biggest Davies one. And and so he comes everybody. in at second. Yeah. So Critchley, yeah. you got him first. Emilio Gay in second. Um, what about third? I th- you know, again, you could pick a million batters who got centuries and double hundreds and things like that. Uh, but I want to go with like the 19 year old getting a century on his first class debut. That's really special. Nathan Fernandez. You know, brilliant. and I, I, honestly, I would have. I would have fought for Keaton Jennings because I've been very impressed by that innings. So impressed by that innings. But at the same time, you know, a debut century. Like, it's just part of the magic of cricket. we got to get, get him a point for that. Brilliant. So obviously with draws are plenty across the county championship, not much change. But if we take a look at the table, Essex are top. Do you have them favourites yet? It's only uh, two games. It's, well, there's a, there's a big gap there now. So in Division 2, there's like, I think there's 10 points between the first and the last place position. Yeah. But they Essex actually have a decent lead. I think they're sort of like a... 18 points ahead of Nottinghamshire right at the bottom. So maybe, maybe. Maybe. They I ain't committing yet. It's two weeks in. You're <laughs> crazy. Too There's no way. There's too no early. Way. And not much movement in Division 2 of the Vitality County Championship either. Um, remember, guys, if you want to keep track and watch the games live, all you have to do is go over to ecb.co.uk. You can find all of the games, all of the live streams, and you can watch your favorite teams playing. So that's it for week two of County Cricket Weekly. Hope you guys have enjoyed the show. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the Cricket District Network so you never miss any more of our shows. Thanks again, Artif, for joining me. We'll see you next time.